So, hi, I'm Martin Sharp. I've been with BCS for too many years these days. Um, and I've also been a consultant for about 25 years doing a whole variety of things. But today is not about me, today is about you. So, raise your hand if you guys really truly believe you want to make a difference to your organisation. You want to make a difference in your organisation. Yeah? That took a little bit of time to think about. Obviously, you need to make a more interesting question. So, raise your hand if not only you want to make a difference in your organisation, but you will not do all the work yourself. Raise your hand. And say hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, you guys are really after doing all the work yourself. This is quite interesting. So, maybe you're here because when it comes down to thinking about how you do consulting, you might have a problem that people might not understand what it is that you're telling them, they kind of go away with the wrong ideas, they may have the wrong impression, or, or the, perhaps you're in a place where even though you've given them the information and you think they've understood, they still seem to make the wrong decisions, which kind of makes your job harder and puts you in a position where you feel compromised. Perhaps you feel like that they just don't understand you. You feel like no matter what you're doing, you just feel like you're being put, pushed to one side. You feel like you give them all the information that you think they need, but yet they still won't listen to you, and you still feel like you're just being pushed away. But it doesn't have to be like that, does it? So imagine if you're in a place where actually everyone understands everything you're saying. They're, they're hanging on every word because they know that what you're going to tell them is exactly what they need. They know that you have the answers and you can explain it to them in a way that they can understand. Not only that, but picture this. You're actually being praised for the work you've been done because everybody sees that it is making a big difference in the organisation and that you're the one that's driving it forward. So what if you have all that skills, all that talent, all that knowledge, and you can help to drive your organisation forward each and every day. How would that feel to you? Where would it take you? And, and that's really what I'm here to talk to you about, is about how we can look at, if you've got these kind of problems, when you're trying to work with your teams and your organisation, but you know these kind of results, how you can make that kind of difference. And for me, making that difference is really becoming a successful consultant. Now, what do I mean by becoming a successful consultant? What I mean is, it's more than just <coughs> having your technical knowledge. Because technical knowledge is great, but if you've got no way of being able to communicate that with people and make them understand and to be able to work with you on something, then it really doesn't help you having all that technical knowledge in the first place. I believe that it also means that you're going to be able to communicate all that well in a way that other people accept it. Has anyone heard that term, that um, if you think you've communicated something, you haven't? Yeah? And because communication is a two-way street, so you've got to have this capability being a successful consultant of being able to communicate well and really understand that the other person at the end of the communication has understood what your intention was and what your meaning was. What I also believe is being a successful consultant is being able to read situations and adapt. Because, let's face it, in today's society, do we think things stand still very long? We're in a constant period of flux and change. You know, before we would talk about 10-year plans and 5-year plans, you know, well, luckily today we'd talk about a 1-year plan. So we're constantly in this period of change. So we have to be able to read these situations and adapt quickly. You know, we have turnover of chief executives, we have new staff coming in, we have directives like Brexit and stuff coming across our bowels. These things all take us by surprise some days. We need to make sure we're prepared and we can change. As a successful consultant, we should be seeking out all opportunities we can to improve. You know, because skills don't stand still. You know, we've just been talking about uh, identification and changes that have been happening in those market spaces. That's a conversation we probably wouldn't have had 10 years ago. We can look at things such as uh, IoT, AI, or other technologies that weren't available 10 years ago either and are now becoming sort of mainstream or commonplace. And even when you think about it, just from not looking at the technology side, but actually looking at where we interact as a society, that's changing too, with more flexible working, 
with more people working in different locations and how they can get on. So we need to be seeking out a constant drive to improve ourselves and to improve our skill set. Wouldn't you agree, yes or no? Yes, okay. I know it's a Thursday night, guys. I really do, and I know you probably love to be in the pub or something, but if I don't get feedback, it means that I think you haven't understood, so I have to reiterate it. It means I'm going to take a bit longer. Okay, so when I, when I ask for a bit of feedback, just like in the book from talking to you, you're going to respond back, yes or no? Yes? Yes. Excellent, so let's keep our yeses and no's going. <laughs> Uh, and, and last but not least, we would need to be able to create solutions that are going to be used by others. Uh, because if we don't, if we create something that isn't going to get used by anybody, then what's the point of doing what we're doing? <laughs> we're almost creating a cottage industry that doesn't make any sense. Oh, sorry, and you're actively hunted as a transformer. I forgot to slip that one in at the bottom. Um, because at the end of the day, we want to be known, don't we, for doing great things. Be able to make things happen, make change happen in organisations. And to do that, we need to be recognised, we need to be stood up, we need to be ones that are out there championing, not necessarily ones that are stood in the background and waiting. So as a successful consultant, you need to be the one that's actively championing your business and the change you need to go through. So why do we need to do that now? I think there's some significant things that are happening in our market space today. But to start off, doing nothing is not an option. You know, because the reality is, if we stood still over here, for a period of time, uh, and we had the whole of the universe going past us, we're still going backwards. Would you agree, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. So doing nothing is not an option. Uh, in most organisations, doing nothing tends to lead to the company collapsing. I, I also think that we're in a golden age of opportunities. We've never before seen so much change in humankind or in civilization. And technology is at the forefront of this and driving it all forwards. I mean, you just have to look at any of the press. I mean, BCS, for example, it always has a great article of things that are happening. Uh, you look at what any of the other manufacturers are doing at any point, there's always new technology coming out. I love what, um, what Elon Musk does most of the time. Uh, I think he's kind of pushing the boundaries of all sorts of things there. Um, so this is great, there's all this opportunity available to us. How can we take some of these building blocks of technology and build something even better at the back of it? How can we combine this technology and build something great? So I think this is an unprecedented time for us to be living in. We've also got this great change in mindset. Whereas before, organisations would look for people that can almost maintain the status quo, can do things exactly to a process that they've devised like 300 years ago or something, uh, and that was great. We're now in this position where actually organisations are looking for great leaders. They're looking for change, they're looking for inspiration, they're looking for people that are not just doing the right thing, but actually, they're not just doing things right, they're doing the right thing, as Peter Drum said. Uh, and this is a great change in society today, in my opinion, by the way. We also have this great drive to do more with less. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, organisations are really looking at how they can maintain things without necessarily spending as much money. Now this gives us a great challenge, but I think out of all the great challenges comes some of the greatest bits of creativity. Uh, and so today I think we should be doing that as well. We've also got what some of them have been the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and with that it's bringing across a lot of changes with the answer to the kind of roles that people are playing. So some of the more routine jobs that people will have had in the past will probably disappear. So having more creative jobs, being more human in your jobs, being ways of being able to be emotive and be able to connect with people, and now they become skills that you're going to need when it comes down to being able to get your point across and making those change happen. I mean, how many years is it going to be before we say, see AI taking over the roles of potentially things like lawyers, medical consultants, and others, where they're literally going to be looking for various different patterns and spin out an answer. So let's leave this kind of idea. So companies need thing, people to do, just do things right, but to do the right thing. So if we're kind of on with that, why would you listen to me? You know, who am I? Now, back in 2007, if you were with me, you'd be in our corporate headquarters in the York University Science Park in Heslington, which is a modern building. It looks like someone's been uh, schooled by IKEA and Lego. And while I was sat there, my boss came in, Paul. He goes, Martin, what do you think you're doing? He says, have you just turned into Mussolini? I've got the clients complaining about you. I've got your team complaining about you. What's going on? 
I says, Paul, you've got me running up and down the country doing it's like 400 miles a day because we've just won our biggest project, $1 billion possible divestment, and the team's not delivering, and the project manager you give me is about as much use as a chocolate teapot. How am I supposed to deliver in this? But mine, you've told me you've done nine mergers and acquisitions before. You try to tell me you failed in those as well. well. That's quite unfair. You know I've been successful in all transformations. But what you're asking me to do is your job. You should be getting this sorted out. Well, I don't want any more excuses, Martin. You get on with it. If you don't get the client back on board, you don't get the uh, team sorted out, then you're going to have to find yourself a new job. And I don't think, no, you don't need that. What am I supposed to do that? In 2007, I didn't really have all the skills that kind of relate and bring people together. So what would you do if you were in my position? Where would you turn? How would you make it work? Now, I'd love to tell you that the months that went on, you know, things got even better. <laughs> but they didn't. <laughs> they got a lot worse because we were running out of time at this point. And time was quite a, good, uh, a precious commodity. And, uh, you know, my monkey mind was on the rampage and he was just going crazy. And it's where you meet me now in pret a just off High Holborn, with a good friend of mine, Ian. Now, Ian's uh, a tall Scottish chap, similar kind of built to myself. And uh, as he's there slurping his coffee and eating his late lunch, he says, Well, Martin, what's going on? You're not eating your lunch, you're not looking too happy. Where are you going with this? I said, well, I'm just failing, and I don't know what to do. I've gone back to the books, I've looked on the internet to try and find more information, I even took myself on another agile project management course, and it's done nothing! He says, right, sounds like you've done a lot of research, but what have you put into action? Well, as you can imagine, I've got a great design, I've got this marvellous plan, which everything goes down to in explicit detail. I've got a schedule showing exactly how we're going to be doing everything. I says, it's great. And he goes, I see. Let me ask you another question, Matt. Do you believe we work with competent people here? Well, yeah, I helped you build the team, you know. We've done a lot of great projects together. Why? I said, well, why are you micromanaging them, Martin? Do you not trust the team? Do you not trust yourself? And it's kind of like at that point I had that little light bulb moment. You know, that kind of buzz, that flash. Have you guys ever had one of those? Yeah. And I suddenly realised actually I was doing wrong. You know, I should be using the skills of being able to relate to the team and be able to get them to work with me to make those changes happen. And it wasn't easy, you know, as I was like, sat there trying to work out how we're going to make them work together and try to get the client back on board and things, because they saw me as a great technologist, but at that point they didn't see me as a leader. And I had lots of pushback from them, you know, you are a great technologist, but you know, you're not here to lead us, you're just one of us. What, what on earth is it to you? And the clients themselves were saying, well, we've got no real confidence that you can pull this off now. But you know, perseverance, and we pushed through, and we made it happen. And that following year, I sat in the boardroom uh, of the hospital group in High Holden, and we'd finished the whole of that divestment, and the whole thing was successful. The client was happy, the team was working like a dream, and I actually realised that actually I needed to learn more about this skill set and share it with others. So since then, I've had the opportunity to work with a whole host of different companies uh, in their kind of change and transformation programmes, and I've kind of chosen and honed my skills in making that work even better. I've also been asked for, to write for the British Computer Society, uh, when the thing works, in the publication of Digital Leadership in 2015. I wrote my own works called Digital Transformation back in 2016, which was an award-winning and best-selling book uh, in the category of leadership. Uh, and then over the last couple of years, I've also become an award-winning international speaker and presenter, and pr pr produced another book on how to run a small business effectively. And it's not because I'm anything special, but it's because the skills that I've kind of 
learned and honed and worked on since 2007 do make a difference. So imagine if, if you could build consensus, influence change, and create that great success in your organization and for yourself. Now, the problem is, I hear loads of excuses as well. Uh, so people, for instance, say things such as, you know, um, I just need to concentrate on the tech. This is nothing to do with me. All the data speaks for itself. I don't need to explain it. Or, you know, my, my people don't send me on courses about this kind of stuff. I just need to do the technical stuff. And all these kind of really horrible little excuses. And that's all they are. Because if you could harness some skills which kind of help you become that great consultant, that great enterprise architect, that great systems engineer, project manager, that person that people turn to because they want to make a difference in people's lives, then that's what we're going to be looking at tonight, is those kind of skill sets. If, however, you feel like you're working at the top of your game, you feel like there's nothing else for you to give, and you're absolutely doing things perfectly, then this probably isn't for you. Yeah, I'm quite happy for you to look at your phones and things. But if you want to make that difference, you want to kind of that extra little skill, then this is what we're going to be looking at tonight. Okay? So, together we're going to look at how we can influence change, how we can uncover uh, how you're not going to do it all on your own, like that spell, uh, and how to create highly effective teams so you don't have to do all the work yourself. We're going to look at how you can achieve your optimum performance, and we're also going to look at how you can improve the income for your business and for yourself. Okay. You're still here? That's awesome. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you for yeah. putting through that. Woo -hoo! Okay, so I've looked at, uh, I've categorised things into five key skill sets when we start looking at soft skills of consulting and how to be a successful consultant. Now when you look at the first of these skills, when you do this right, you're in a position where you can create influence. When you don't do this right, then what you'll do is you'll create alienation. People just won't be able to relate to you. And by creating this, this great feeling of influence, uh, you can make people really do things that they weren't intended to originally. And this power can be used for good and for evil. Because let's look at what happens normally in an organisation. Has anyone, and don't raise your hands to this because it's a horrible question, uh, has anyone been in a situation, just remember it, where you thought you were doing a great job, you were doing things right, and then someone came and gave you that, that horribly dismissive piece of feedback? That thing that just really took the wind out of your sails and made you feel awful. Yeah? We've all had those kind of situations. So, and what happened in that moment is, from being brilliantly giddy and excited because you're doing something, you went to a site like this and you know, you're not really that bothered about doing that change anymore. That's influence. And that's how someone's had influence over you. Whereas, have you ever worked for somebody who's just one of those great people that seems to see the best in everybody, that can kind of bring out the best in you. They seem to have that right piece of information, just the right time for you. They have that right little bit of knowledge that takes you that step further. But not only that, they also see the best in you as well. Yes or no? Yes. Come on, guys. <laughs> yes or no? Yes. yes. Yeah, and what's that feel? That feels amazing, doesn't it, being with somebody like that? And again, that's influence as well. So when you start to understand how influence works, you do have a choice to make. And I do hope, and I hope you all put your hand on your heart and say that, when I leave this room, I'm gonna make the right choice, and I'm gonna to choose to be the second person there and influence people in a positive way, in a way that's actually gonna champion change and make things happen. And to help people with that, I created a, a thing called the Rich Relationship Roadmap, and that kind of takes people through that kind of sets of skills. It kind of goes through four key areas where we look at those. And, and these can be simple things. So, for example, um, raise your hand if you've ever been in a meeting. <laughs> That's an easy one, isn't it? <laughs> They're not hard, these questions. Um, okay, so what you might find is if you've ever been in a meeting, and I don't know why suppliers do this a lot. Have you, actually, have you ever been in one of those meetings with the suppliers? They come in, 
and I kind of give you the proposal, I'll put it on the table, and then instantly sit down like this. Yeah, where the con they're constantly blocked, so you can't see what's going on. Now this is a very negative way of sitting. Whereas actually, if you sit up and forwards, so you're away from the back of your chair, you keep a very positive air, you keep your hands above the table so people can see them, you've instantly created a much more positive effect on everybody in the room. Right? And these are the kind of things you can use to help get yourself into the right state, because then you're ready for answering questions and, and looking at part, as well as making sure you're conveying the right information to other people as well, so they know that you're there to do business, not because you're scared of what you've written on a piece of paper. I mean, have you, why should you be scared of your own sales proposal? It's crazy. Anyway, the next thing we're going to look at is industrialize. And what do I mean by industrialize? Now this for me is how we make sure we don't do all the work ourselves. So this is taking each kind of element that you've got in your process and writing it down in a real simple way that other people can understand it. Because if you don't, then you're in a position where actually they will be able to repeat what you're doing. So that when they make the mistakes, is it their fault or your fault? Because you haven't necessarily given them the instructions that they need. So putting a, a process around these things, even simple things, means that you've got a way of being able to repeat how you do things. So just like, for instance, a lot of the skills we're talking about tonight, I put a process around it to make it simple for other people to consume and to be able to remember them. Now, for that, I go through a thing called the Powerful Productivity Plant. And, and in here, we can look at a variety of different things. And again, looking at it from the human angle, not just from the machine angle. So, Raise your hand if you've seen a process with like nine or more items listed on it. Yeah. Twenty items or more? Yeah? <laughs> we all have them. Especially from IT people for some reason. Definitely is, is something we do originally, isn't it? Um, now, the thing is, you guys might have, have heard of a, a thing called number seven is the magic number. Yes or no? Yeah, and, and, and it comes back from a study that was done in 1956 by a psychologist that I can't remember the name of, but basically looked at uh, what was the amount of information someone could store in their short-term memory. And it turns out, on average, it's somewhere between five and nine units. Um, so five and nine units of information you can keep in your memory. Now, seven is the difference between two, which is why seven became the magic number, and so most people will say you can remember the seven items. So when you're creating your process, and then how you're going to develop that. If you make sure you're keeping it within seven items, certainly at the top level, then people have got a higher chance of being able to retain that knowledge without having to forget what's going on. Yeah, makes sense, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. And again, these are the kind of things you can look at when you look at how to industrialize your process and make sure you've got something that's repeatable. The next thing we're going to look at is interrelate. And this is really looking at a lot of those kind of key communication skills that you have. Because if we learn how to communicate better and how people absorb information, then we've got a much better way of being able to get our message across. And we're going to deep dive into this a little later, and that's the expert connection creator. Um, the next skill in the file that we look through is called being an individual. Now raise your hand if you feel like you're an individual. Brilliant, I love that. Uh, now raise your hand again if you find at least one hour a day for yourself. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, and then this is the key thing. Uh, part of what we need to be doing is making sure we take care of ourselves. You know, this, this body that we've come in is the only one we ever have. I don't think we've quite got modern science to a place where we can have replacements. Um, uh, and also, we need to be feeding our minds all the time. Because we agreed at the beginning that actually in this age where we need to be constantly upgrading our skills, did we not? Yes, no? Mm -hmm. So one of the things we do need to be looking at is actually how do we build this within ourselves and making sure we are treating ourselves as the valued individual that we are. Um, so I've created the perform personal performance process which kind of goes through that and, and helps you kind of key into it's like seven key areas you need to do as a person to do that. And one of the key areas is finding the hour for yourself. Because within the space of an hour, there's so much you can do. Uh, I used to do an experiment with people to time to two minutes, but actually two minutes is quite a long time. Um, and you can do so many things in two minutes. You know, you, you can do tweaks, you can do uh, Instagram stuff, 
Facebook, WhatsApp, you can do in the emails, uh, you can come up with a great idea and write it down. You know, you could read a book, you could actually meditate for two minutes. There are so many things you can do in two minutes. Two minutes is such a valuable thing. But yet we squander time. And I've heard it said that killing time is the worst murder of all. So find time for yourself, that one hour a day, and how you can improve yourself and make yourself even better. And the last of that kill skills uh, is income. And it's looking at, you know, how can you generate more income for yourself and for your organisation? Uh, the reality is, uh, most businesses would not survive if there wasn't an income stream coming into it. I think just looking at the AGM this, uh, this evening, we suddenly realised that actually as a group, this, this branch would not exist if there wasn't an income stream coming into it. Uh, and, and you as yourself won't survive if there is not an income stream coming into your, your household. So you need to be taking care of those kind of elements of how you can generate money for your organisation. Because uh, with change, change is costly. Uh, and, and change causes disruption in ways that sometimes we don't necessarily think about or understand. And those kind of waves ripple through. Would you agree, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the reality is there should only really be three reasons to change. You know, those three reasons are you're generating more income for the business, you, you're keeping the business alive, so it's a, keeping it as a going concern, or you're looking at saving money for the business. If you can't, tie your change to one of those three items, then it's probably wishful thinking. You've got, you've got an idea that's not going to go anywhere. So thinking about how you deal with the income side and bringing income into your business or into your household is very key to, to making sure you are a successful consultant. And uh, for that, I use the money maximizer method. Anyway, without further ado, we're going to go through into the expert connection creator. So the expert connection creator, as I said, really looks at some of those relationship things. And I need to make sure I ask more questions. <laughs> okay, so I used to write down CLIP, C-L-I-P, and this is going to look like I'm going to work with through today. And the first element of CLIP, this, this has a key interest, is this. This, this is you're doing something with people, and you ask them to do something, they will not, never ever be prepared. So you always have to have a couple of minutes worth of content ready for that, so that you can get that done. Or remember to repeat yourself so we've got that ready. Um, and we're going to go a little bit more into that in a minute anyway. So the first of our uh, items to see is for communication. And what we're going to look at here is how, how do we absorb information as, as, a, as a species, effectively, and how does that work? So I'm going to go through the model VAK which stands for Visual, Auditory, and Kinesthetic. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard this one before. Excellent. So basically, as, as people, we absorb information through communication, mainly three fashions. We either do it visually, so it's, this is what we see, effectively. We do it auditory, this is what we hear, or we believe we've heard. Uh, and we do it kinesthetically, this is what we feel or what we do. Now, there's a whole host of different studies around how these forms of communication work and you can look at the various different numbers and they all give them different weightings etc but in general what you tend to find is most people will absorb information visually first uh, then you've got another set of people that tend to absorb it auditory first and some people want to absorb it like kinesthetically first when they've actually done it themselves now we don't just use one of these all the time. So for example, you can say I'm, I'm just a visual person. Uh, we actually use all of them. It's just we have more of a preference as to which way we go. Now we can have a think about, um, think about this. So if I was going to ask you to imagine a, a red workbook, what, what image has gone into your mind? Is it, a red, is it actually a picture of a red workbook? Or was it the words red work notebook? So vast majority of people here, I would say, are visual first. Yeah? And as soon as you've thought something, you can't unthink it. That's it. It's gone. It's in there. And it's a bit like in those conundrums, like um, the word not or forget. Have, you, have there's anyone ever told you, don't forget to get the milk when you come home? That's my wife, sorry. Um, <laughs> or something like that. Now, your brain can't process the word forget, and it can't process the word don't, because as soon as you've said those words, the next word that comes out of your mouth, it has to remember. 
So you know when you're telling your children off, you say, you know, don't you hit your brother? It's hit and brother are the two things he's remembered. Yeah. Okay. And then this kind of acts out from all of our communication. So when you start thinking in these kind of terms and then understanding how people are absorbing this information, it suddenly becomes really clear why sometimes our communication might not be hitting home. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, no? Okay, so we'll do, it's going to move on to the, the next part, which is really looking at then how do we take on this information. So we've talked about how we're sensing and where it comes into our body. So the first thing that happens is we get some stimulus. You know, so this could be as simple as we see in a book. It could be something quite jarring. So for example, it might be someone's accused you that you've caused the problem with the project and that you're going to cost the organisation a million pounds. Okay? That could be a stimulus. And it could be a stimulus, well, let's look with that one, actually, that's a good one. So, our senses take this in. So we've heard it, or we've seen it, whatever's happened there, and our senses have taken it in. And what happens next is, we have our analytical part of our brain, so the system part. Now, this is, this is like our Google, effectively, up here. Yeah? Apart from it's a bit more like Alta Vista was back in the day. Anyone remember Alta Vista? Raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Remember how irritating it was that you had to get the exact search term right? You know, there's all this natural language processing thing going on. Yeah, well, that's our brain, unfortunately. So what it does right at the moment in time is it's taking <coughs> this fact that someone's accused us of, of uh, causing a problem and, and costing them a million pounds. And it's trying to find something in our memory that it can match it to. Because our flight, flight, Fight, flight, and free response is now going to hit. Everyone recognise flight, fight, flight, and free? Yes, no? Yeah? No. So it's trying to pattern match what was the last time we had a similar situation. And it might have been that time when your mum said, don't hit your brother, that we just talked about a minute ago. And in which case, it's saying, well, what was the action when I did hit my brother? Oh, yeah, I got sent to bed. That was quite a bad thing. Or whatever else, where the injunction happened. So you're kind of thinking, okay, your brain's doing this automatically. It's saying, if that's because that happened, this feels like it's this big, then it must be worse. It must be for a hanging, effectively. Yeah. So what it does then is it creates this story, right, uh, in your mind that this is what's going to happen. And, and the next thing it does is, is that changes your state because it's firing off all those melanin pathways inside your brain, which it recorded from last time this happened. And it's your mum's voice that's telling you off again, and you've got the cold sweats. Yeah, the adrenaline's running, the various other different hormones are going through the body, and you're in this state of, of panic, potentially. So then you need to then show this, because all, all these bits have happened in your brain really quickly, now you need to show it out to the world so you make a strong thing. Now that's going to be one of the three kind of things. You're going to fight back. It wasn't me! I didn't do it! It's not my fault! He did it! What other accusational way of being able to do it? Or you're going to freeze and go, I don't know what I'm going to do. Or are you going to kind of try and run away from the situation? Now, if we know we do this as people and we can recognise that in ourselves, then it's highly probable that other people are doing the same thing as well. Yes or no? Yeah, because we all run similar kind of patterns. It's just we don't necessarily know what stories they've had in their background. And, uh, you know, different people go through different traumatic events. And these are all stored, they've been brought up at different times. Now, if we remember back to what we said about the, the VAK and how we can understand that now to, to influence how we communicate with people, we can also use this now to understand how we communicate with people. Because if we know that by saying things in a certain way, it may elicit quite a bad response, we can take that into account and actually find a better way of being able to say the same thing. Or, if we give the information across and it doesn't have the response we're expecting, we can try and work a better way out being able to describe that so that it doesn't create that instant panic or it doesn't create an adverse reaction in the person that we're working with. This is also a really good thing to think about also when you're involved in situations. So now you kind of recognise and understand how these processes work. When you're in a situation where you feel like actually you're getting the hot sweat so you're feeling a bit panicky, recognise it calm yourself down and you can choose to have a different response. Just because your brain plays this automatically doesn't mean that the, the, the logical thinking part of your mind can't catch up at a later stage. It's just a little bit slower than your chimp mind. Anyone read The Chimp Paradox? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good book. I like it. 
Uh, and again, same kind of thing. So just take that extra minute to calm yourself down and you'll think more logically and then the response that comes back out now will be more appropriate to that situation. So the probability is that person's blaming you for the million pound loss might be because they've found it, they're panicking and trying to find out who's actually done it. And it might not actually be able to do with you. So that's kind of looking at our communication process and thinking about how we can actually make that work better for ourselves when we're working with people. Now, we're going to move on to our next one, which is the L. Now, for this one, we're looking at not necessarily how we communicate, but actually how we take on board some of that information. So we're going to be looking at how we learn as people. Because if we understand more about the learning process, then it means that we can help to make sure people get hold of that information and retain it better. And uh, don't just necessarily take it and, and forget it. Um, because there's a lot of people that just tend to consume information and don't tend to do anything with it, produce action out the back of it. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never known that consumption ever leads to anything other than any kind of real action. It might create a reaction, but uh, never really a key action. So you have to really take the information and do something with it. So looking at the, the learning styles, there's a lady called Bernice McCarthy, and she created a thing called the Format Formula, uh, which she kind of looked at the things like the BAK, and uh, looked at the uh, communication styles and how we can absorb information, and said, actually, how do we really apply this in real life? Because, like we said, application is key. Yes? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, good. We're still awake? Yes or no? Yes. Excellent. Another quick question. Are we human? Yes or no? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Excellent. Okay. So, she reckons that about 35% of people uh, do this by actuation. So basically, if you can give them uh, motivation, the reason why, effectively, then they will charge and they will go and do something with that. So have you ever been in one of those meetings, or have you got a friend of yours, or someone in your team, or a colleague or something, where you just have to have a discussion with them, and before the end of the discussion, you've all actually seen the lights have gone on in their eyes, and they're charging out the door to do something? Yeah. So we've all got characters like that, uh, where effectively you just need to give them the why and they can, they can work out everything else from it. And at that point, you know, you've already got a, a committed member of that change. So that's not everybody. Because, you know, we do have a bell here with people in there. And there's laggards as well in front runners. Now, we have this other set of people. We've got the apprenticeship people. Uh, which worked out about 22%. Now, she says that they don't necessarily need just the why, but they also need to know the what. They, they need the teaching, they need the learning, they need to know the points of what it is they're going to do. But once you've given them the what, they're, again, quite happy. They will charge out and they will get things done for you. So if you think about your team or people you work with, I'm pretty sure you'll recognise some people in there. Actually, once they've not only just understood the why, but what they're supposed to do, they're quite happy to carry it forward, aren't they? Yes or no? Yeah. yeah. We've then got the, the, the third classification of people, which we've got the uh, activationists. Now, the, these people um, don't just need to know the what, they also need to know the how. So th these are the guys that you're going to be effectively coaching a lot of the time to try and get the next thing done. And, and you'll try, probably find these are the people that they'll go through the whole meeting, they'll come back and need to know more from you each and every time. And again, I'm pretty sure you recognise that in some of the people in your meetings. Yeah. And, and the last classification of people you've got is the application people. And these are the people that don't tend to take your word at anything, or, or don't kind of get the idea until they can manipulate it themselves, so that so they can kind of ask questions. They're the what-if people, uh, the people that kind of always have that three, three or four irritating question at the end of the or the people that kind of find that little kind of chink in your armour, or the grey line between the, the rules that everyone's got. So if you guys recognise people like that in your teams, because these are good people, by the way, because you need a what if on your team. If you haven't got it, then you know who's finding out where your weaknesses are before you've actually got something alive. So you need a whole mix of these kind of characters within your team, but because you've got this mix, as you can probably appreciate, it's going to make it very difficult to, to get meetings done where everyone understands. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Because we need to answer kind of all those four questions. We need to give them the why, the what, the how, and the what if. 
and that then matches back to, like we've been saying before, with how we absorb information from the communication point of view. Does this make sense? Yes, no? Yes. This good stuff, yeah? Good. Um, has anyone come across the four stages of competence before? Okay, good. So I'll take you through this one. It's a, it's a nice little model because everyone kind of doesn't know what they don't know. It's the unknowns, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You've got your known knowns, your unknown knowns, your known unknowns, the unknown unknowns. So we, we, we've got two axes here. We, we can look at actually how conscious are we of something exists. And then we can actually look at then how much competence do we have in that. And, and this consciousness also relates to the amount of effort and, and the competence relates to the amount of skill that you have in, in being able to deal with that. So we all start life with the unconscious incompetence. You know, we, we didn't know we were incompetent at that point in time. And, and, and there's so many people you come across and they kind of think they know everything because they haven't actually opened their eyes to the remainder of something else. Teenagers, I think, are one. Or my teenagers, definitely are one, I think. I, th I heard a saying that said that as a teenager, you know, you should go out and do everything right there and then because when you get older, you suddenly then you can't. <laughs> and I think that's a great saying, because it's, it's this kind of open, this awakening to, to the world, effectively, a way of being able to say, actually, there's a whole world of possibilities there, how do we want to do that? And then you can go start to learn those skills. And that's where you kind of move from unconscious incompetence to consciously incompetence. <laughs> you kind of realize, actually, you know, I, I'm not good at this, you know? So I think about any kind of skill that uh, you, you may have wanted to pick up. So, my sport of choice is canoeing. I love canoeing. Uh, and uh, when I first started this, when I was like 14, 15, I was useless at it. Uh, I just literally went around in circles all the time. And it was a real effort to, to paddle in a straight line. It really was. It was so bad at one point that the guy who was doing the instructor, he tied a stick to the back of the boat to make the boat longer so it got in a straight line. But you know, you keep persevering and you put the extra effort in, you put the extra hours in, you make sure your skills are honed, you keep working at it, and all of a sudden you move from being consciously incompetent to consciously competent. You can go in that straight line in a boat. You can configure a HP server. You can do the things that you need to do with your data analytics because you've kind of done, done that extra little bit of effort and you now know your skill really well. And then finally we're going to unconscious competence. And this is where you do things automatically without even thinking about it. Uh, and it just becomes second nature. This is kind of one of the, it's like the holy grail of IT service management that everyone suddenly knows how the process is working. Just, it blissfully works quite peacefully in the background. Um, interestingly enough though, when you reach this level and you're at mastery of whatever skill you've got, when it comes down to taking that information out of your head to pass on to somebody else, when it comes to industrialising, it's a real effort. You need to almost take yourself back a step to be able to then create that process to make it simple for other people to actually absorb it. So when we think about how our teams are coming together and our change processes are coming together, how we're imparting this information to other people, we need to be thinking about what level they are, the level they are in, as well as uh, how they absorb information, as well as you know, making sure we get the, the messaging right. Otherwise, we're in a position where we could overload them quite quickly kind of brings us quite nicely actually onto this bit, the learning zones. Okay. So there's kind of three recognized zones when it comes down to, to moving through learning new skills. The first one is the comfort zone. Yeah. We all recognize the comfort zone. The comfort zone is, is like here. You know, you, you're just nice, you're sat, you're comfortable, you know exactly where you are, you're not moving, everything's within your reach, you've got everything in the world, it's exactly as you thought you needed. Now the problem is, when you're in the comfort zone, you're not moving, you're not stretching, you're not breaking your boundaries. In fact, after a while, most people get quite bored being in the comfort zone. And they, they kind of get itchy feet. It's a bit like you know, when you've been in a job for a couple of years, you kind of know everything, so you kind of know you need to make a change, you need to do something to make it more exciting. So you suddenly start to stretch out, and you think, okay, I'm going to do something different. Still alive, it's okay, but comfort zone still there. So we kind of reach out into our learning zone. We're going to kind of develop a new skill, a new way of being able to do something. Now, the great thing about the learning zone is you do feel stretched. You should feel stretched. You should feel almost that, that feeling that can I actually make it, can I not make it? 
It's a bit like one of the crit have you ever heard the criticism of smart goals? Where everyone says actually you shouldn't make goals that are realistic. Yes or no? Yeah. Now now to me there's there's kind of it's a double edged sword because yes you should have stretch goals that kind of push you and make you learn something really new. But if you don't have small milestones in between that you know you can achieve, you can soon get quite despondent. Yeah, and the same with, with your team. If you kind of throw them a massive stretch goal and say, you know, reach that in one step, they're going to probably fail. Uh, and that's where they hit their panic zone, effectively, at this point in time. Uh, because you can't push them beyond their limits. Now, some people will quite happily move, and, and they'll move quite happily between the, the comfort zone and the panic zone without any, any problems. I once met an athlete who was an ex-footballer. I wish I could remember his name. And uh, he was talking about the way he, he deals with his comfort zone. And he wanted to become really inspirational for becoming this ultra-athlete. So he was planning on doing a, uh, a swim across the, uh, from Morocco to Gibraltar. He was then going to cycle from Gibraltar to Monaco, and then from Monaco he was going to run to Cannes or something. Kind of crazy to me, but his kind of impression was he took his his uh, comfort zone and compared it to a hula hoop, you know those things that kids use. And he says most people live their life in this hula hoop, and they kind of push the hula hoop forward and shuffle a bit until they get to the other side, and then push it a bit and then shuffle. A bit. And he says that's all they do throughout their entire life, and that's that's it. Forty years have gone and they've moved a meter, maybe. So his his thing was you just take hold of your hula hoop, you throw it in front, and you run like that time, you get hold of that thing again. Uh, and that's for him how he grew. But for many people, that doesn't work. So you've really got to work out in your team where is their comfort zone, where is their learning zone, and where is their panic zone. And be prepared that, you know, when some people do hit that panic zone, you're there to help pick them up, give them the support that they need, and put them back into the road of being in the learning zone again. Does that make sense, yes or no? Cool, excellent. Um, oh, I'd like to take this one out. Okay, inductive and deductive learning. <laughs> so, um, if any of you guys, uh, if you guys are in academia, uh, you probably already know this anyway with regards to inductive and deductive learning. So, there's, there's two real methods that people learn. You either give them the process and tell them, this is what we're going to achieve, this is the frame we're going to achieve them within, this is how you go from stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, go away and do that. Uh, and it's very process driven. Um, so again, this could be a way that some people will work inside your organization. Uh, and sometimes that's the way you need to adopt it. Now, if you do a lot of uh, deductive learning or deductive processes, then people will get bored because you're effectively telling them what to do all the time. And especially if you're working with creative people in a change environment where you're looking at trying to create some great change and transformation, you need to kind of spice it up a little bit and make it a bit more interesting. And that's where things like the, the inductive learning side work. So this is where you kind of give them an idea or give them something and let them go away and run with it. And they've got to kind of learn from that process what it is that they need to do. They need to build their frame. They need to build their process. They might not do it in the order that you expect it to happen in, but they will do it. So you need to give people the chance of doing two or three different things. And this also supports that learning zone kind of element of it. Because if you're telling them everything to do all the time, they're going to get quite bored, aren't they? Yes or no? If I just stood and just talked to you all the time and didn't actually ask you questions or get you involved and laughing a little bit, you'd be really bored by now. I'm pretty sure of it. And thank you for not, not agreeing to that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the next part we're going to look at is actually how do we use all this information we've just learned about learning and communication to actually impart information onto other people. Because it's great having all these theoretical models, it's great knowing how our bodies work, etc. But actually, if we can't use it in our building of relationships, it doesn't make much sense. Yes or no? Yeah, yeah? good. So I can kind of look at this and broke it down into a series of seven steps. So the first one is we announce what we're going to do. And you've probably recognized I've been doing this as we've been going through this. And that's to make sure that people are aware talking about. I do it in a very subtle way. I may say, you know, this, what we're going to talk about is something that's quite important. Or here's the thing. This is really important to you. You might as well write this down. All these are ways of announcing that there's something coming. And suddenly it gets people's attention. As opposed to just going straight into, you know, we're going to talk about this and this and this. It's a bit like with my wife at home. You know, so if she just talks to me straight away, 
and she gets irritated if I don't hear the first couple of words, which is the really important part of the sentence. And it's usually because I'm absorbed in reading a book or doing something else. But it's actually say, Martin, I need you to automatically have her, my full attention is on her. And it's all sorted. Life is good. Yeah? I'm not going to ask you if you've had that experience. But the same thing kind of happens with your teams. You kind of almost got to preempt the fact that their mind is elsewhere. You know, some people are going to be working in your organisation thinking about I don't know, what they're having for tea, where they're going on holiday. Uh, it might be if you're in a, a board meeting or something, the, the people might be thinking, how is it going to be affecting my department? How is it affecting my part of the business? None of it is necessarily always going to be anchored solely on what you're saying. And as such, you need to make sure you've jolted them out of that kind of position where they're, they're almost zombied because they're not listening to you into a position where they're actually attentive and you're listening to you. So that's the kind of first one we're looking at. So we need to make sure we're announcing what we're doing. The second part is then we need to give them the advice that we're looking to impart. So this might be a uh, piece of information we need to give them, it might be training material, it might be some learning, um, whatever it is that we need to give them. Now this needs to be wrapped up in those four kind of elements that we looked at from uh, Denise McCarthy. So we need to be looking at why this is important, why should they be listening, why is it important to listen now, why they should be listening to you, <coughs> uh, because that's all the questions that are going through their mind. They're kind of thinking, hang on, you've just jolted me out of my sleep here, and why on earth do you want to do all this? It sounds like hard work. So you kind of got to give them some real reasons. So that's the, the why you should be looking at. And you need to give them the what. Why is it important? Now this, this what can't just be the hard facts. Because, you know, we're, well, many people may think we're logical beings and we like to do things logically. The reality is we're, we're emotional beings. You know, how many people have really bought that red car because, you know, the red car is the most logical thing to buy? I'm going to ask that question. No, you keep your hands down. Um, and, and that's the thing. We are emotional. So we need to be making sure when we're talking with people, not only we give them the hard facts, we also talk about our beliefs and our opinions and why we believe it's the right thing. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're there for. We're there to lead people. We're there because people want to know our expert opinion. So don't leave it out. That's as important as the hard facts when it comes down to help to build that relationship and get people moving. They can go through the what's and the how's and the what ifs. So you know exactly what it is and you answer those kind of questions. I'm going to come back to questions in a minute, actually. Now, you might want to use an analogy or two, because sometimes you might be talking about quite a, a complex subject or something that people might, might not have a good frame of reference to. And it's always good to have a, a couple of nice analogies available to you. Now, try and make these as simple as you can, something that's every day. Um, so, for instance, let, let's have a quick experiment. We've only got a few people here. Let's try and think of one everyday experience that we can all have. I'll start off, so for instance, going on holiday might be an experience. Do you want to? Um, uh, brushing teeth. Brushing teeth? I hope everybody does that, I agree. Lucky? Your clothes, shoes. Yep, clothes and shoes, buying clothes and shoes would be a great one. Um, Julie? Following the theme, travelling to work. Travelling to work, yeah. <coughs> see a movie. See a movie, yeah. Buying a car. Buying a car, yeah. <laughs> Depends on which coffee, yeah. I know that feeling. Feeding the cat. Feeding the cat. If anyone's got a cat, definitely. Locking the front door. Locking the front door. And make a tea or coffee. Make tea or coffee. So there's lots of different things that we can use as these kind of analogies and keeping them really simple so that people can relate straight away to them is key. The other thing you need to do is not only do we talk about that, but we also need to then relate it back to our subject. Because you know you hate it when someone kind of gives you an analogy and thinking, what? <laughs> where did that come from? Now, we we're going to talk about, um, uh, let's, let's try and think of a really horrible analogy here. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, identity management. And I don't know why identity management is really important. Uh, and identity management is really important because it's a little bit like dandelions. Um, and when we've got a series of dandelions, then they, they're quite unique in their own way. And uh, they're also like scattered around, so we know where they tend to be, uh, and we can't really identify them at any point in time, so they're dandelions. Now you're all probably thinking, what the hell am I smoking at this point in time, talking about dandelions, identity management? And it's because I haven't related why that was anything to do with identity management. So the, the, to finish it off, you need to be saying, 
an identity, for an identity management piece, it is your unique identity. It is determining which dandelion you are in the entire field. Because while they may look very similar, they are all 100% unique. And your identity is 100% unique to you, even though you may look similar to many other people in the world. So if you haven't related that analogy back, then the analogy is wasted. So do remember to reinforce it at the end uh, of your analogy. Does that make sense, Jasmine? Excellent, love this. Uh, anecdotes, so stories are wonderful things. In fact, stories are the way that we used to communicate as, as a species and pass on really key information until people started to write it down and then like wrote down stories. Although I do believe the first thing that was wrote, written down was something to do with wheat or something. Um, yeah, it was a list of who hood and who wheat in the Middle East. Stone tablet. Um, so anecdotes are a great way of being able to pass on a lot of information and experience. So when we look, think back to our inductive learning and deductive learning, now this is kind of the inductive side, because you can tell a story which can get across a lot of information without necessarily having to point people in because that's what we need to do. Um, because people are actually quite intelligent most of the time, um, and they like to join the dots and it keeps them interested. So for example, when I started uh, discussing about what we we're going to be doing here, I told you a story about my background. So you could see exactly what, what I've come from and why this is kind of relevant to me. Now you might find there's different stories that you've used inside your, your organisation, but your story should be interesting. It should always be told in the first person. It should always be um, in the present tense. Because if you do this in the past tense, then it becomes very boring. It's like being narrated to them. After a while, it starts to go to sleep because then we use that specific voice like you used to use when you were telling the story on a night when you were about two years old. And this is the same kind of voice that people use when you get hypnotized. And eventually you do fall asleep. This happens a lot in board meetings, I do find. I do understand that board meetings are actually for boredom from for real work. Anyway, so make sure your stories keep being exciting and interesting and relevant to your topic. So for example, if I'm doing a change project, and I want the team to be a lot more comfortable with the fact that you know, issues are going to happen, then I'll tell the story. I'll say, well, one of the first ever m as I did was at Killingall Power Station back in 1998. And Killingall Power Station, if you don't know it, is a great big grey gas-powered fire station just outside Grimsby on the Humber Bank. Now, at the time, NRG Energy were buying Killingall Power Station. Uh, we get a foothold inside the UK. And we were there to try and do the separation for Empower. And we'd gone through everything. You know, we'd, we'd done the transition, it all come smoothly. The network had been separated. All the active directory was separated, all the identities were fine. Uh, all the systems were working. Nothing had been a problem. You know, we were just literally on the final stages. When all of a sudden, we find this little 2501 Cisco router in the bottom of a rack which didn't work with any of the passwords, and you've shown my age, I know, which didn't work with any of the passwords uh, that we've been supplied by Inpower. There was no record of this little router. So we looked at the uh, connection and went to a BT socket the wall. There was no, no, no record of BT of this circuit of existing anyway. So I'm kind of thinking, yeah, so what, what do we do at this point in time? Now, I'm not stupid because I've done a few Cisco routes before the past, and sometimes people forget to store the running configuration. So if you restart it, it loses it all. So I just unplug the network cable. No one's shouting. No alarms are going on. So I think we're okay. And I'll leave for the weekend. Have a great weekend for this, etc. I'm coming on Monday morning to the general manager going, Marcy, Marcy, good job you're here. We've been on emergency gas all weekend. It's the gas monitoring supply. Yeah. So things will go wrong inside your change. We just have to get on with it and then work around it and make sure it happens. Just be quite open and frank with it and we're fine. And this is a real good way of being able to get people to have a laugh, have a giggle, have a realisation that you know, change causes problems that are unexpected. So find those little experiences that you've had in your life that you can make into small anecdotal stories and make them as amusing as you can because what people do is they will remember them and they will give them comfort. While other people are laughing, they're learning. So, moving on, 
we move on to the next bit is to give people an activity to do. Now, this doesn't mean that we're going to have people like, running around between desks, etc. That's a, not the kind of activity we're looking at. We're looking at some kind of action. So, like we said before, some people won't learn or won't understand things unless we've actually given them a, 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 a tangible thing to do, that kinesthetic thing to do. So, get them to go away and read a paper, get them to go away and uh, research something. If they're, if they're really great with ideas, etc., get them to go away and build something or do a bit of research for something. But get them to do something. If, you, if you're having a meeting with your teams, etc., and there's no actions out the back of it, then, well, if there's a great discussion, but really, you've missed an opportunity. You know, there should be a lot of actions coming out of these things to get people to do things. Does that make sense, Jasmine? Uh, and the last thing we want to do on this part is, is to assent. Now what we mean by here is give them a, a phrase that they can anchor this on. So when you finish the meeting, you finalise it, give them a very quick phrase, maybe a, a, a reminder of uh, something that's happened within the business, maybe something to do with how uh, a famous quote that might be appropriate at the time, but something that was memorable, so they've got something to anchor it back. Do you remember when we talked about the chimp brain earlier and how we have input signals coming into our senses and how it goes into our Google, etc.? We want to try and fast track that and give it a, it's like a, a hashtag. Right? So by giving this a, uh, a quote at the end of it or a, a quip or a phrase or something small, short, that you could literally say to them at another time and it instantly recalls the whole of that conversation is a real great way of solidifying that. And then turning it from being going into something where you're able to re explain lots of things into just being able to re explain one or two concepts. That makes sense, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Okay. I know more tomorrow's finished, I do promise. Um, the last thing we've got is answers. I said we'd come back to QA. The reason why I come back to QA type, type things at the end uh, of this is because there's two places to do QA. It really depends on what you're meeting with people about. If you're meeting with people as a briefing session, then try and take Q&A out of the briefing session so it's not done in front of everybody. Because all that hard work you will have done in imparting your knowledge and getting people to understand what's going on could be easily and quickly d destroyed by one question uh, if someone doesn't understand something. Because what you'll find is questions cause more questions. And that's all that can happen. You'll just fuel more and more questions coming out. So if you can, get the Q&A out of the room, or do it at a different time. There are going to be situations where you can't, and you have to take Q&A with regards to what's going on there. So try and slot Q&A into the middle of your session if you can. If you've got a, a team briefing or something where you know everyone's pretty much on board and you, you know it's quite a safe environment, welcome to take Q&A at the end. But with, with Q&A, it can be quite dangerous and damaging in the message that you've given over to people if you get the wrong question. Then we'll be in one of those meetings where someone's just asked that really awkward question right at the end and it's kind of destroyed the whole of your presentation. Probably derailed your actually don't answer that question, please. I should stop asking negative questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the last thing we're gonna look at is probing questions. So this one's a quiz for you. Okay. I have got the powerful answer producer, which is seven W's. I'd like you to try and name seven probing questions starting with W. Why? What? 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 When? 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 Sorry? When? Yep. Who? Yep. Where? 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 So these, these, if you're asking these questions, use these questions all the time to probe into people and, and really understand what it is their problem. I'm sure you've all heard the famous Einstein quote, uh, which says, if he's given an hour to, to try and solve the problem, he'll spend 55 minutes asking questions to understand the problem, and then only five minutes after going with the answer. You know, so questions are really important. And, and the other good thing about questions is, people love talking about themselves. So you can ask as many questions as you like, and they, you will get so much information back. And then when you can you take that information and then return it back to people, suddenly they realise you've been listening to them, and they feel valued. 
and they feel like you, you want to make a difference in their lives. Which you all truly do, because we all put our hands on our hearts early, didn't we? We said we're going to use this for good, yes or no? <coughs> so this is the kind of power we have when we look to really build relationships and look to interact with people. So that's the end of that section. I hope you guys have taken away some real good value and some good notes. I will put the video up on YouTube. I'll let Mike and Lester know where it is so you guys can look at it later as well. Well, thank you very much. Again, Mark, there's an awful lot to um, think about there, and uh, useful, useful stuff to good act to remember. So, um, so my session is going to be um, shorter. Uh, number one, because it is intended to be shorter, <laughs> and number two, because I've got a sore throat. I can't get rid of my cold, so I don't really want to be talking for too long. So I'll probably be ten or fifteen minutes, depending on how long you, you, how much you interact with me. I think we can stay for a little while longer if we, if we choose as well. What I wanted to do really was just outline some of the things that I think um, are not terribly well known um, and that may be useful to you and um, some of these things uh, Martin himself has actually, has actually part participated in. So my name is Mike Broomhead, I'm a member of the BCS, a, 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 a mere mortal, just a fellow member, I'm not on the committee or anything of Manchester, uh, so I sometimes go to some of their events, but I'm also um, on the committee, the organising group for the Enterprise Architecture Special Interest Group of the BCS. I'm sure you all know BCS have these special interest groups for a, 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 a whole variety of eclectic uh, things. Unfortunately, you're only allowed to be a member of three six, I, I believe, which I think is a bit of a limitation. I wish they'd increase that. Um, um, so anyway, I realise there's a bit of competition because there's lots of special interest groups, but uh, I would encourage you to uh, consider the Enterprise Architecture one. But in any case, some of the resources I'm about to share with you are actually freely publicly available in any case as well. <clears throat> so, I've got a clicker. A little bit about me, just because it's um, kind of nice to introduce yourself a little bit, isn't it? So, of, you know, what, 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 do, what do architects do? I mean, I, I call myself an architect or an enterprise architect, but what does that do and what have I been doing and how do you get to be an enterprise architect is sometimes some of the kind of questions that people might be. So, they're the last kind of couple of jobs I've had and um, they're some of the characteristics that I think are noteworthy. We can sort of... Um, um, agree or disagree as to what makes an architect really, but the multidisciplinary thing I think is really quite key. Um, sort of tend to get involved in leadership roles to varying degrees, but I have been a manager, I'm not, well, I am a, a, one, one now with a small, a small team, I wouldn't say that's my primary competence, um, but, but, but leadership I think is part of the mix. Certainly a problem solver, occasionally a bit te techy, inevitably, not always, but okay, yes. And sometimes even a sort of like a speaker or explainer or evangelist. I mean, I'm not sure that they're all of the quali qualities that I would um, call out, but I think they were the, 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 the key ones that came to mind who put this together in any case. Yeah. And, that's, and those characteristics have varied an awful lot over time. Is this going to um, do what I think it is? Yes. So I don't know what it is about you, but whether you're aspiring or practicing or, or you call yourself an enterprise or a solution or a digital, I'm sort of assuming that I'm talking to people who have some some connection with the word architect. I mean, whether you call it yourself principally or, or not um, will, will vary. And I think there's an awful lot of, per, per the previous page of myself, and per all the buzzwords in the industry, there's quite clearly an awful lot of, of good uses of the word architect and, frankly, an awful lot of abuses of the word architect as well, I would assert. Uh, but let us move on. Um, we share. So I just wanted to have a brief kind of minute on the why should you pay attention sort of thing, you know, why is sharing good? I mean, apart from the fact that it feels lo lovely and fluffy and cuddly and it's interesting and you get to learn something, but then to one of your points, you don't necessarily act on it, some people. You know, so if you get to learn new information, you can't act on everything. So let's, let's just be a little bit more tangible as to why sharing actually real world experiences as well, because that's actually, I think, part, part of this. I think sometimes it's just nice to, sorry, not nice, I'll take that back. It's actually beneficial. Uh, it's quite important to not feel as well as not be alone in a challenge. You know, if you're facing something and it's seeming a bit daunting, um, having known that somebody's been there or done, and done that or something comparable even uh, can be very assuring and, and, uh, and um, give you confidence. 
helps you accelerate decision making for sure. It can help you convince or influence other people. If you've got that independent experience, you know, if you've been in that situation where you, you, you've worked something out, you've really worked it out, and you're trying to convince people using perhaps some of the techniques that Martin has shown us. Thank you, Martin. Um, but it's still not quite landing. You say it by opinion is X, Y, Z, but it's just, they just won't quite believe you that it's X, Y, Z is, is the answer. Sometimes you just need a little bit of independent proof point that that is indeed um, the thing to do. Find best practices and get new ideas. So, you know, I think there's really good specific reasons to go and seek out other people's real world experience uh, that, that would be the similar or comparable to uh, your own situation or challenges. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. So, the Enterprise Architecture Special Interest Group have had three annual conferences now uh, in London, but we'll, and I know we're not in London at the moment, I'll come to that answer in a moment. Um, and I live in Manchester, so. <laughs> um, the third one um, was this year, 2nd of July, so clearly I'd like to go to it. Except you missed it, of course, it's now, now October, so you can't. Um, but the good news is this was videoed, and so all, I think all, the vast majority, if not all, of these sessions are available online. Where is he? Where are you, Martin? Second row, to the right. There he is. Creating influential proposals, so a different topic to the one we did today, is that right? Yeah. So you can hear more of Martin. But you can hear more of an awful lot of people. We had particularly senior keynotes um, by the Global Chief Architect at Uviva. I think this guy manages something like, I think Dal told me it was about 100 or something architects. Some phenomenal number. I mean, clearly Aviva is a huge organisation with apparently a huge change programme. So, I actually, I, mean, I, thought, I thought he was fantastic, actually. He really did give a very inspiring um, opening keynote. Um, Colin Smart and Deloitte are also very, uh, very good. Um, forgive, forgive me, I, I, I just found Jason Selby, Selby to, be, to be particularly inspiring. Um, and many, many other uh, excellent sessions. And the good news is that these are on YouTube. You don't have to register. I'll give you a link in, this, in a moment. You don't have to register. You don't have to pay. You don't have to go out of your way. You just need to make a little bit of time. Yeah. So what I thought I'd do is just give you a completely biased and subjective highlight of three sessions that I thought were particularly interesting to me. I'm not saying they're the best three sessions, and Martin's is not one of them because we've just heard from him, so that is the only reason I'm not at all saying that you didn't make the top three. This is not a top three ranking, it is just to give you a little bit of a taster in the space of a few minutes rather than try to explain every single session to you. Yeah. I mean, I think there's 18 or something in total, so it's quite, quite a big number. Yeah. So... Um, <clears throat> Definitely one challenge that sure is a god we always we all face quite regularly is you've got something that's really quite complex or you know niche set of skills or just difficult for people to relate to or just downright detailed and techy and gory. Yeah, I mean it happens. Um, but you've got to communicate that to people who just don't have that background, don't have those skills, don't don't understand that domain. Um, and absolutely, um, you know, Martin has uh, shown us the power of communication today. I thought this uh, session by uh, Nick was, had some particularly useful resources and visual examples in particular um, that really kind of just make it clear as to how, I think the scale as well as the complexity in his example, it was a real world case that he was uh, presenting. Look at that, some of the facts, something like 80 countries thousands of bespoke contracts, thousands of suppliers, tens of thousands of whatever else, yeah? So how on earth do you get your head to all of that? Really, really uh, interesting uh, visuals to, to see. So that's one that I would definitely recommend. I think each, if, if I'm right in uh, saying this from memory, each session is about 40 or maybe 45 minutes, I forget exactly, so they're, they're, not, they're, not, uh, they're not huge. Um, another one was um, from um, a former colleague of mine, Paul Holman at IBM, which is architecting in the age of agility. I don't know if how many of you have faced this, but there's an awful lot of disruption and cloud native and agile and let's just do it and let's prototype and expand from there and where here we go, which is to be welcomed in many respects, but does slightly uh, concern some people 
uh, occasionally when uh, questions such as um, uh, end-to-end -end testing or uh, documentation or um, other kind of key aspects that some of us have grown up with and like uh, are less well t attended to, let us just say. I'm not saying that all Agile and digital people do that, however, I have met some. So, <laughs> so, so what is the role, what is, how do we make architecting relevant you know, in, in that kind of uh, age? It was basically the premise of Paul's, um, of Paul's session. I'm not going to try to do justice to, the, to what the sessions explain. I'm trying to give you a little bit of a, a teaser as to why uh, I think the sessions are warrant your time. Um, and Paul actually, interestingly, has said, uh, it's got this point that actually we've had these seven or so winters of enterprise architecture before for other reasons, and we've come through those winters for various for various reasons. Be it um, a, a, an integrated package like SAP will will see to everything, or be it that that, that, that um, you know cloud is going to be etc cetera, etc. Cetera, watch representation, and again there is some um, good tangible. So it's not just about the theories; there's some good tangible five best practices that he recommends uh, in particular. Um, and finally, the, the third and last one that I will just uh, highlight uh, in a little bit of a pick and mix lottery. Again, you know, this is just three that I found interesting, but they, they, they all warrant. Um, is um, a gentleman whose name I can never ever pronounce. You can read it yourself and you'll see why I can't pronounce it. Uh, he's based in Australia, if I remember correctly, in Melbourne University, I think. And he did, um, um, a session to say, what do enterprise architects really do? And, you know, things like Zachman and Togaf, where you can go on weeks and weeks of education, and there's an awful lot of sometimes slightly dry, academic-like um, stuff to take on board. You know, is that really what enterprise architects do? And of course we do tend to um, take the useful parts out of those frameworks, but do we implement those massive frameworks all in one big lump? Well, no, frankly, nobody ever does. And that was never the design point, actually. The, the design point was really to be more like, or my interpretation anyway, is to be more like a body of knowledge where uh, you, you pick the best bits. Um, but even then, actually, um, the gentleman <laughs> concerned um, has quite some cri critique, a little more than I would go, uh, of um, enterprise architecture frameworks and say, actually, what people are really doing when it boils down to it are these six things. If you have a business lens and an IT lens, and you have the sort of static, the rules, and then the long-lasting, not quite static structures, and then the fairly dynamic changes, you have this CSV nod um, kind of thinking of consideration, standards, visions, landscapes, and planning designs, and there's much more to his, um, his, I was going to say framework, but it's actually quite a simple one-page a visual where he just expands examples of all of these six. Yeah. And he gives some other examples of um, what he considers to be bad or uh, distracting ways to look at enterprise architecture versus what he considers to be um, good ways. And uh, how he's come to these considerations is not just his personal view of what he woke up and thinks about, but he actually did some surveying um, of uh, global organizations from many, many countries. Uh, so he's got some, um, uh, you know, some an evidence base to support how it's come to this observation, really. Yeah. So there are the three, really, just to again pick from that um, big menu of eighteen or so that you saw. Um, so let's get to the, um, the beef. Um, so the specific, rather. Um, so you can join the special interest group. Like I say, I think the BCS limit people to three. It's slightly unfortunate. So you could join. Uh, and and all these are all independent, okay? Whether you have joined it or not, you can still follow us on LinkedIn. You could still follow us on Twitter, and you can uh, find the, the stuff from, I think, the last two or three conferences. I can't remember if the first one was videoed, forgive me, uh, on YouTube. Freely available, um, so um, just search for, for BCS member groups or B-C-S-E-A-S-G. Um, those links, if I send the PowerPoints, do have the actual links, but you can find these things, frankly, with a search engine in a matter of seconds, so it's uh, not, 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 not difficult. Um, and, and, I, and I suppose that the last question, or the, la the last sort of way to connect is, you know, we had an EA event uh, uh, pretty much 12 months ago, I think we were saying, Julian, was that right? Yes, I think it was sometime in the autumn, um, slightly better attended than this, this, this one, the one I, I organised. 
Um, you know, we're very happy to come and do another event in Manchester. Um, Lorne, who was, I was hoping was going to be here to, tonight, but seems to have got lost, um, he lives down south, but he's very, very um, um, prominent about advocating doing events outside London. Uh, sorry, Lorne is the chair of the uh, Special Interest Group, I should, should have said. Um, we've done one before, we're very happy to do one again. So, if you have any suggestions, then tweet us or email me or Lorne or anybody. The communication channels are open, basically. Um, you know, tell us what's on your mind. There were, uh, of these, um, almost 30 people that registered tonight. Uh, there were five or six specific questions. Uh, one of the questions certainly was, what do enterprise architects do all day, or words, words to that effect? Um, you know, if you have specific objectives, I'm very happy to, um, to consider how we can use some of our resources to, to, um, to, to help. Either a standalone event or as part of other events that are related, and I'll, 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 I'll circulate ideas through the Manchester Committee if, if, if we get uh, a handful of ideas. Yeah. Pretty much, I think that's about all I wanted to say, other than taking your, any feedback or thoughts you had on, on, on the content of those communication channels. Yeah. Any comments at all? I've just mentioned that the state groups, I think I, I, I'm in the three state groups. Yeah. And I've forgotten how to change your. Are you going to. Gmail? Does it tell you at the bottom? No, no. Go to bcs.org, log into your account. And you can do it from there. Yes, and, and do right. my, my whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I mean. It, uh, yeah, just in terms of LinkedIn or Twitter, I mean, presumably people use both reasonably, I, I don't know. I mean, any, any other suggestion of communication vehicle would um, just seem the most obvious things to use, really. By show of hands, who uses LinkedIn? So all By of us, sure all, all Twitter? Less, less, than, less than LinkedIn, yeah, yeah, yeah. So on both, so. Yeah.